All right. Uh, welcome to the podcast. My name is Les. This is the World of Art and Magic podcast, where we talk about the intersection between um, human psychology, storytelling, and uh, spirituality. And specifically, uh, this relates to games. It relates to story and games and, and in popular culture, like comics and stuff like that. And uh, so today I have my new friend Pat with me. Uh, Pat, can you give us an introduction? Hi, uh, my name is Pat, and I am a solo game designer and developer. And I have the Masters, which is a hand painted puzzle adventure game set inside Claude Monet's eyeball. Um, it was entirely hand painted with real paint on real paper, and it took me seven years to make. And um, it came out in July. It's very exciting. So it's it's called the Master's Pupil. And it mm -hmm. takes place inside of Monet's eyeball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, kind of loosely life. There's a lot of his art, obviously. You'd have to. I'd be mad not to. Um, but it's also, you know, kind of, it's a loose kind of um, biography in a way. Um, so it kind of follows oh, wow. the chapters of his life as, it, as you kind of play through it. But it's mostly like a puzzle game. So there's this kind of... Uh, increasingly hard, but with color and moving chunks of painting around and that kind of thing. So it's, uh, you know, it's it's more than just a kind of a standard game, but then it is also just a puzzle game at the same time. Yeah, well, uh, real quick, just to let you know, your audio is kind of coming in and coming out. Uh, hopefully that's oh, not okay. an issue. Um, um, but I... If you like, I, how much have I got on this? So is this a, it's an audio podcast, yeah? Or is it a video uh, as well? It'll be, it'll be audio video, but you can, you can kill your video if you want. That's up to you. Um, no, that's okay. I was just saying I can also record the sound on my phone when you've got anything. Oh, okay. That you can edit uh, in. Uh, let's, let's, tr let's try to do it this way and, and see how it goes. It seems like it's coming in okay. okay. For a moment, it wasn't. Um, so real quick, I'm going to share my screen as long as my screen doesn't completely melt down on me because I want to show the, uh, I want to show the trailer of this, like the trailer for this is just so cool, man. So let me, uh, let me go ahead and present. So this is the master's pupil. Style, inspired by classics like Braid and Limbo. But it's not just a puzzle platformer. It's also a sort of interactive biography. Some of you may have recognized these paintings as being recreations wow. of Claude Monet's work. Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you the coolest part. The game is set inside Monet's eye and you play as his pupil. See it now? <laughs> Our little character here will be wandering across his iris and through the artist's life, seeing things from his perspective. Over the course of 12 different levels, we'll have to overcome the disease that threatened the artist's eyesight and solve puzzles to help him complete some of his greatest works. Each level is based on color, physics, and a set of puzzle mechanics that the player will discover over time. Of course, you can't call this a hand-painted adventure without seeing some of that work in action. This is Pat Nayum, the creator of The Master's Pupil. Hundreds of hours have been spent painting backgrounds, foregrounds, and assets to sculpt a world that fits with his changing style across his life. Here's a shot of all the completed level art in the game wow. versus a photo from 2017 when Pat had just started working on the game. I can't even imagine the amount of dedication that this took. This will definitely be one of those games where I'm constantly stopping just to take in all the scenery. I mentioned earlier that this is a biography of sorts, but there won't be any audio descriptions or text to read. Rather, the player experiences the ups and downs of Monet's life through the audio and visuals. This includes events like the passing of his wife, Camille, and the progression of cataracts that threatened his artistic skill and livelihood. So be sure to consider color, space, and timing as you traverse the world of his eye, as one wrong color combination could end your journey. 
In July 2021, Pat tweeted that the first build of the game was finally complete after 1,700 hours, 12 levels, and 83 puzzles total, the result of two and a half years of part-time work. But things obviously weren't done there, as testing, sound design, and overall quality of life improvements were next on the to-do list. But on January 3rd, 2023, Pat tweeted, The Master's Pupil is out this year. Wishlist it today. If you appreciate all the time and love that goes into creating a game like this, or any game really, I recommend you check out Harold Halibut next. All the characters and objects have been crafted. Okay, so the, I guess that wasn't the actual trailer itself, but it was the uh, was somebody's coverage of it. Um, but yeah, man, I mean, like you put seven years of time into this game. Like, what is it like? to be on the other side of this now? Like, do you, uh, do you feel like there's, does it, is it almost anticlimactic in a way? Or is it like, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> well, the launch was quite, you know, that was quite climactic. Like, you know, it wasn't anticlimactic. It was very, you know, I guess, yeah, climactic. I don't know if like, we can use that as a word without the anti, but it is like, you know, the actual launch was really exciting because it was, it was this nervous kind of energy building up to this moment of like you actually get to release the game and it have it come out and you know the the launch itself was much bigger than i ever anticipated because this was you know went off before and uh, you know so many of my posts went viral and so there was this kind of um the there's so many more eyeballs on the game than I had anticipated. And so that kind of made the game even bigger than I thought it was going to be. So it was quite, you know, climactic. But up until that point, the game itself had been just this large part of my life that had up to seven years. But generally when I started working on the game, I was still working full time then. There was a lot of like working on the weekends and working on the um evenings and that kind of thing and that went for like two or three years and then there was three years where I went part-time work so I was working just like I'd stop at like midday and then start on the game um so it wasn't necessarily seven years but it was like I had started seven years ago or even earlier than that you know like the idea of the game I thought of like 10 years before launch so there was this element of my life that had the master's pupil in it and it was a consistent like but mm -hmm. along with this entire time and so for me it was this nice release of going to finish the game and have it be completed but it was also like a bit of a void because suddenly there was there was something missing you know like i i was really really excited to move on to the next game because there was this like part of me that was that was empty you know like there was this like for seven years i'd been working on this one project that it had been my like creative pursuit and so you know there's this kind of uh emptiness there that's just wasn't that just needed to be filled again you know um yeah which is a weird feeling because it wasn't something that i was expecting to to do but it, as well as because like the next game i had already been thinking about it planning for it for the last couple of years so it's I've had, had all these kind of ideas going. Um, and so I was eager to get into that as well. So there was this kind of strange, um, yeah, a lot of different emotions basically. Mm. So you, you, you started it, you came up with the idea 10 years ago and then you were working on it basically part-time. What were you doing before you did you ever transi did you transition into doing it full time or did you always have like something else going on in the background yeah so in um so i've, I've been a graphic designer since i left uni basically and so i've done a lot of freelance work and so that kind of gave me the privilege of like being able to set my own hours and so when i got to when i when i finished the kind of demo of it that was the first few years i thought well i really want to work on this more consistently. So I decided, you know, just reducing my hours, um, you know, pushing clients back, um, basically just like allowing more time in my days to, to, to work on it. Obviously, but, um, but it was a way of just kind of uh, 
you know, making room for the game. And so that was for the next, you know, three odd years. And then the last year I applied and got the uh, Screen Australia grant. Australia, in Australia obviously, um, uh, like a government kind of body that funds different like arts projects and usually have been funding, you know, screen film and TV, that kind of just area. Uh, but it was the first that they had signed up for, uh, you know, grant money for games. And so I applied for that. With that. And so that, that enabled me to go full time as well as, um, you know, I had enough money for a marketing, a little marketing budget or a marketing plan and then um, porting it to Switch as well, Nintendo Switch. So, you know, again, privilege of being able to apply for something like that and get it is just kind of like a bit more than anything. Yeah, yeah, there's, there definitely seems like there's a lot of opportunities for creative people now, if you, if you're open to looking for it. I mean, I don't, I don't think I've heard of anybody getting a grant for making a game, but for what you do, it, it makes so much sense, you know, because it, it is an art, it's very artistic. I couldn't imagine you getting a grant if you were making like, I don't know, Mortal Kombat or something like that. You know? <laughs> but there was, you know, like in, in the set of grant, there was, there was quite a lot of them that were different types of games, you know, and for Australia, like there's been this high um, focus on getting movies to come and get shot and made in Australia. So we've been trying to like poach a lot of like Hollywood kind of productions to come over. And that's worked really well since like the eighties as just like an income for Australia. Mm. Yeah. Part of our GDP trying to get big productions to come and spend money here. Um, and, you know, they've finally kind of realized that games make a lot of money. So they're kind of going, well, you know, let's try and fund a lot of games and try and get productions work in Australia as well, um, as well as the kind of, um, you know, homegrown stuff as well. So there's this kind of like renewed focus on to try and get not just artistic games, um, although that is a focus as well, but also just like games as a whole, trying to get more of an industry happening in Australia. Huh, that's, that's pretty interesting. So is, is there a, is there a big homegrown scene that's there, but it's not as, it's not as big without the influence of like Hollywood? Like what, why is there such a push to, I mean, I understand the GDP aspect of it, but like from a, from a cultural perspective is like filmmaking and that sort of thing, a big thing in Australia or no? Uh, somewhat, I think, um, you know, like there is a lot of, there's a large community here making and like Australia comparatively to around the world has like more like big stars and actors like GDs, like our um, population. So then we've got this like crazy amount of like high functioning, like, or high, you know, threshold, whatever, like um, actors and cinematographers and directors and that kind of thing that have come from Australia. And so, yeah, it's one of our exports, I guess, is like, is that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily, uh, I think it is culturally relevant. Like, you know, a lot of us are into film, um, but, you know, it's just counterpoint to this big sports culture that's around as well. So I think, you know, there is a mentality of trying to keep cultural, um, having some kind of, uh, you know, we're, we're dominated by American culture in Australia. And so I think there is a, if anything, as cultural push, it's a way to try and have a little bit of influence on that. And so we've got some, some kind of dual identity, you know, thrown into the world a little bit as well. Oh, okay. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So what was what was the what was the plan behind this because okay so it's your plan as the pupil in monet's eye and how how did that how did you turn that into a game mechanic like i don't i don't understand how the how does the actual puzzle function like you have to mix certain colors or something along those lines yeah originally the game was in like the idea was a game set in an eyeball and I had played, um, you know, Braid and Limbo. Yeah. And those were like part of that, you know, like indie apocalypse that happened in like 2010 or something. And mm -hmm. so 
around that time, a little after, I had um, I had played those games after not playing a lot of games for since I was a kid, basically, or like an early teen. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to, I was fascinated at like this new wave of games, these kind of like indie games that were being made by one person or a small team. And I thought, well, that's possible. I could do that. And looking into it, you know, there was more being made, you know, Unity and an Unreal Engine, they were being like established then. So my idea was to make a game, you know, set inside an eyeball. And then the next thing was to have it set over someone's whole life. So, you know, you start, if you have like the kind of uh, round verse of of someone, um, to me, it looks like this kind of like valley shape. And I wanted to set a... um, the start of someone's life on the edge of the iris and then move into the pupil over the course of their whole and have like pupil as this like you know big void of like death that you're kind of heading to and so there was this like large concept and that to make a puzzle game because for me i tried all these different like prototypes of different types of games because like learning the engine and i was learning how to like game design um but those original games that i wanted to that i was had played and had inspired me braid and limbo were 2d side scrolling puzzle games and to me that felt like the easiest way of making a game because i had tried these other prototypes that were like fun and enjoyable but i had no way of like conceptualizing uh how a game can function over time and you play through it without it being like you start on the left of the game and then you go to the right of the game and you just keep doing that and there's puzzles in the way. That to me felt like an understanding that I could kind of get to. So even though I had made these different prototypes and they were really interesting, I built back down to a 2D game because I could. I could start on the left, I could make a puzzle that is just a 2D image or like a 2D moving thing and then you have to get to the right and then that's it just consistently you know you just come across the next puzzle and the next puzzle all i liked about the game specifically was that like eureka moment it is like that like moment where you go aha and you've got the problem solved and that's really interesting i wanted to foil with that i had the idea of a game set in an eye and then there was a tiny middle ground there of like who would this game be about and why you know, n- not necessarily why, but maybe who who this person is and how it would kind of uh, impact the rest of the decisions I was making. And so I remembered about Claude Monet, who had cataracts, um, and that was that kind of seed moment of like, well, here's, if I'm setting it in someone's side's eye, the bad of the game can be this cataract that's kind of forming in the center of the game above, you know, pupil. And at the end of the game, you can kind of climb up into this cataract castle, and that would be like a trajectory that you could be heading on. And so then the other elements seem to kind of peer into the game, you know, puzzles about colour and mixing colour theory, um, as well as like, you know, space and and shape and and making sure those things are integrated into not only Clay's life, but the old Monet's work as well. Huh. So whenever you whenever you started doing this, you hadn't made a game before. Um, so what was the process like of like actually learning game design and making puzzles? Because like a puzzle in a game, you can, you know, it can be something that can be really fun. Uh, or it can be like infuriating and you're like those old adventure games where you're like, what you're supposed to pick up the pie and throw it at the person's face like this doesn't make any sense like yeah i i I find i I understand what you mean like when you when you look at like the game design of something like a role-playing game or something like that like i don't even understand how it is that they conceptualize that because it seems like there's so many moving pieces going on and it does seem like a 2d platforming puzzle game would be simpler but I imagine that it has its own unique challenges for sure, like how to make it engaging. How are you communicating with the player what they need to see in order to uh, in order to not be stuck, but also be engaged enough, right? 
Yeah, yeah, instantly. Like I had, uh, I called it, you know, um, like I, I, I considered frustration as a tool, you know, because if a game is too frustrating, people rage quit. And if it's not frustrating enough, it's too easy and it's boring. So you had to, well, I had to find a way of using frustration as a form of, as a meat that I would pull up. On. Like it was a, it, it was a method or it was like a, almost like a goal of like, okay, this puzzle needs to be a little bit frustrating. I need to tick off three, you know, three things and then it, it needs to be slightly more frustrating than the last one. <laughs> kind of strange yeah. and a little bit like um, Machiavellian where you're like trying to be frustrating on purpose, but it is a method and it is a way of constructing a puzzle. But otherwise it was essentially um, creating uh, like a language that you play, you know, talk or, or, or create with the player, what they understand and, and you have to try and spell it out for them. So everything is very kind of um, slow and precise and making sure that everything is understood before you introduce another layer of complexity. You know, the simplest things are understood before you add another layer. Um, so at the very start of the game, for example, you know, the, the game itself is set across these, like, as you saw in the, in the video, you know, this, it's set across these kind of like um, curving vine-like structures, um, all these shapes. Um, but there's these kind of like, I call them sniffer doors. The game doesn't have any language. There's nothing describing what they're called, but there's these kind of things that block your way, but they can also sniff you. And they, when they sniff you, they kind of judge your color and what color you are, um, and they will either let you or not. This is explained. But it's just um, taught to you as you go. So the first time you come across one of these, it's a red door, and you're, there's a red little draft, so a little jet of smoke um, that's red. And usually most people avoid that because it's just it looks like fire and it looks a bit spooky, so they'll just avoid it. And so as they come up to that thing, jump over the smoke, and then they interact with the door. The door will sniff them, and then it doesn't like that they're white, and it will sneeze and blow them away. And that pushes them into the red smoke, which changes them red. That is a way to interact with the smoke and make sure that it un the player understands that this thing is, you know, how this thing functions, how they function. They can change color if they jump in the red smoke. Um, but then also one and run into the door. And now that they're dead, it sniffs them and it goes, and you know falls down and you can access you can keep going so there were these ways of like tutorializing exploration so a player could, could go explore fun but they're also like learning how the game works behind that scene uh so it's like rather than just telling them and read to the store it was a way of just leaning in and letting people experience what they're doing rather than being told what to do Hmm. Okay. And so you introduce it to them by tutorializing it uh, through certain situations, and then uh, you slowly ramp up the complexity with adding in different different elements that are That's kind right. of pulling off of one another. Huh. Yeah, yeah, so, exactly. So you were looking at like you were looking at limbo and you were looking at braid whenever you were whenever you were doing the design for this game. Um, were you also looking at like other puzzle games like Portal or anything like that? Uh, yeah, like I played through Portal and that was awesome. You know, like that had kind of, I just love Portal so much. Um, mm -hmm. As well as like, you know, Journey is another game that I just adore, wow. which was like a, a PlayStation, um, you know, exclusive back in the day. I think you can just get it now on PC. But um, it is just, you know, it's a phenomenal kind of game because it's, it's not necessarily a puzzle game, but it is, even though it has kind of moments in it, it's experiential as well. So you're kind of, um, you have freedom to move around. Unlike, you know, it's not a side scrolling 2D game, it's 3D. And you have the experience to kind of walk around. And, but it is just more about like biting up against an area and working out what works to get it to kind of 
you know, to, to access the next sections. It was a huge influence, as well as just the kind of general, um, not necessarily theme, but the way it describes its story and describes its, you know, environment is just so kind of, I don't know, like immersive. You're kind of, you're thrown into this environment and you just have to experience it. And so that I kind of wanted to do it as well, quite a lot. Okay. So you, you like that kind of um, nonverbal storytelling. It's kind of like the storytelling that, that it's kind of in the background and it's something that's communicated to you, like in the atmosphere and the mood. In yeah, the way exactly. You know, like the master's pupil doesn't have any dialogue in it or, or text that describes what's going on, but it is a kind of biography through all that's this like soundscape that essentially plays sections or, or has kind of environmental sounds of what Monet would have been doing at the time. So, if he's in a you know a cafe or if he's in a um, a gallery, there's different kind of like layers of soundscape that kind of blend together. And again, I I could similar to the the idea of having a sniffer door and whatnot is like they're all these are all like abstract things that are kind of a bit surreal and a bit they're not realistic, but they're kind of taking from the reality that's outside of the eyeball, his life and you know, you're getting to kind of experience this strange world in between, you know, what he's thinking, the real life, and this kind of strange, you know, iris world that's in the eyeball. So I know Monet, I know his work, but like, why didn't, what stuck out to you about him? Why not Van Gogh? <laughs> I feel like Van Gogh, <laughs> could, well, it, was, it, it was definitely confirmed with him having cataracts. So, you know, if the game is set like literally in his eyeball, having cataracts as his story was like a way of kind of tying him in. But, you know, I love Bonet and I don't think, there's, two, there's essentially two reasons why Monet and maybe I could have like made it work with someone else. Um, mm -hmm. Because another, like the idea that, you know, that I had going as a sequel for The Master's Pupil would be to have it inside Van Gogh's ear. And so in the last, he cuts it off and then you're having this like, but anyway, but Monet for me is like, he's, he's just beautiful. Like there is, nobody looks at a Monet and goes like, ew, yuck. Yeah. You know, like it's just, it's kind of stunning in that very like basic way of just being beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, because for me at least, you know, and the second aspect of it is that he is the cusp of what, um, of, abstractionism you know you know impressionism was like everyone was realistic and trying to be as real as possible and trying to get mood and whatnot but they weren't necessarily uh they weren't dealing with like abstract shapes and colors and whatnot so the impressions came along and started to literally blur but also blur the lines between what was kind of super realism and what was like the impression of something and so that's why, you know, all their colors started to separate and they were abstracting, you know, gradients in real life, a gradient from like red to blue in a, yeah. you know, in a sunset and they were breaking it up into the, into the various different colors. And that to me also lent in with what I was having at the time was was coming up with you know, these ideas about puzzles based on art and about, you know, color theory and separation of color and making those kind of things loosely linked with everything else in the game. And so, having this kind of, uh, someone like Monet is, uh, you know, he, he, as I started layering on the, all these different ideas, he just fits so well. And so I could kind of create this like world around him and around his style that fit with it in the game. Mm -hmm. Was there something specifically about him that you like, that you could relate to as an artist? Like, did he have, I don't know anything about his life. What was his life like? Was he, I imagine he it was, wasn't as tragic as Van Gogh. Uh, no, no, he didn't struggle as much. Um, the artist struggle was, was different with him. I think the one thing that I've really, um, like, associated with him is how much dating, how much he just wanted to, and for him it was that painting. For me, it's always been, like, different things. Like, you know, I went through, art school, I went through film school, and now I'm 
I'm hopefully landed on games because I quite enjoy them. Um, but for him, it was this, it was painting and obsessed he was painting and he was with colour. And, um, but he was very prolific. He was continuously making. And I think that to me is not, not necessarily like I'm continuously making, but I like to continuously make. And so it was almost like an inspiration as well of like getting to understand this guy's life and to understand how obsessed he was with everything he was doing. And so for me, you know, uh, that's like kind of like, you know, it was really interested in it, seeing how like obsessive he was with everything to do with art and colour and, you know, his painting. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, and it just became an instant more than anything else, I think. Yeah, th those are the people that really inspire me too. Like, uh, I'm really inspired by people that are, extremely prolific you know um just keep just, doing yeah they just keep doing and they keep creating like um there's there's some artists that are just like you know they're artists artists in a way like uh i don't know if you're a fan of clive barker i don't know if you know who he is no i didn't think He's, so uh, the name does sound familiar but i'm not not sure so he wrote uh he wrote and directed hellraiser oh right yeah but i mean he he wrote that as a book he's he's been a novelist he's been a filmmaker and then he also paints as well he started painting i think like in his 40s or something but like uh there's videos of, of his of his studio and he's got like literally hundreds of canvases everywhere and um they're just like all these like his the technique is not uh it's not really much as mature but that's what i like about it because like it's it's like this genuine it's almost kind of like a childlike kind of aesthetic to mm. it that, that you just you you feel it whenever you see his work that sometimes you know it can that that sort of thing can be killed by being like too technical you know what i mean yeah 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 okay mm -hmm. yeah yeah so i i really dig people that do a lot of a lot of different things and i, I guess that's a part of the artist struggle too is like you said you know you you started with doing uh, painting and then you went into film and then now you've landed in games. I mean, I know that, I know that you've picked up things from those, but do you want to go back to doing like film or something like that? Like, um, I, you know, like for me, I was going to move forward to the, you know, another one of my um, kind of inspirational artists or especially as a little kid, um, I always liked Da Vinci and he was kind of like yeah. multidisciplined, you know, like he was a painter, yeah. but then he was also like an, an, an you know, he was into astrology and like, mm -hmm. like uh, engineering and like, he was kind of like a polymath. And I always under, never understood that because it's not really maths. You can be a polymath and not the maths, but, <laughs> and, um, but you know, like I always liked the multidisciplinary aspect of film you know so that's why i kind of went into film or well, i was in art school interested in painting but i i was doing a lot of like um all sorts of different things so i did like a minor in media arts where i did like like one of the semesters i did a thing in like robotics and then like or like you know kinetics and then like um you know i did some coding i did some, like a lot of animation i was doing a lot of like photography and i was kind of doing all sorts of different things um it was just that when i where i went to uni there was only majoring major in basically painting or sculpture or textiles there was no kind of like other thing that i could do so i had to kind of major in painting um but even then i was trying to do different things all the time uh but then film was always like when i got the opportunity to study film and go to film school um the australian film television radio school which is like it had just opened up basically because when I first out of uni, I wanted to do different things, but there wasn't a lot of options. And it's not that I was like, you know, I'm not that old. I just, in Australia, there was just not that stuff, much stuff going on. So, you know, like there wasn't any bachelors I could go and go do a film studies without, there was nothing hands on. It was always like go do media studies or something separate. So, you know, this, this degree in film school, I thought that'd be a 
doing, you know, it was a diploma, it was one year, but it was like basically two weeks on, one week off. And I could, it was all sorts of different semesters. It was like cinematography and then it was acting and then and very hands on and doing stuff. And so, you know, film to me has always been this, I've always loved it since I was a kid. You know, my mum is obsessed with film. And so there was always more stuff that was, all, you know, keeping up with the, like, what was the Oscars and, you know, watching all these kind of art house movies all the time. And film to me is always that, like, multidisciplinary you know, artwork. There's acting and writing and directing and um, cinematography and, you know, set design, all this kind of thing. And for me, I really wanted to do and build that, but there wasn't a ladder that I could climb. And that's the way I looked at it all the time, was like this ladder, especially in film school, was like, what did I want to be doing my day-to-day -day life? And if you're a film student or if you're an early director want to be, at least in Australia, all I could do was maybe write a film by myself or with someone and then get try and get that made. And if I was lucky enough, I could maybe do two of them every year. You know, once every six months, I'd have a weekend where I'd shoot a short film. And then around that time, I couldn't, um, I wouldn't be making film. I could be in the film industry. I would be working in the big machine. Like I said earlier, you know, those big Hollywood productions that come to Australia, they kind of fund and support a lot of the film makers or I'd work on a TV show or something like that. Um, and I wouldn't be doing my own creative work. I could, but I'd have to kind of like, you know, I'd be in these like big things, you know, maybe doing set design or something else, but I wouldn't be like directing and being able to like, there's no lower form of director that still directs. You know, you have these different um, like people that work on film that are called first, you know, the first um, assistant directors and stuff like this, but they're not directors, the director, is the one controlling in the, like, the artistic kind of direction of the film. And I want to be kind of doing that. So being multidisciplinary, but then still getting to kind of, um, you know, work on my own stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I kind of started seeing these games as well. So there's this kind of like meshing of times, these new kind of indie games. And what I realised was that games were opportunity to do this really complex thing but I could do it sitting next to my bed in my bedroom every day if I wanted to like for an hour a day I could go and make a game and seeing these things coming bigger and becoming like large it wasn't it wasn't the same as making a short film it was a way of making a a, a very big game but a smaller version of that so you know, short films don't go and play at your local cinema. Like, they're a different thing that gets displayed elsewhere in festivals to, um, you know, like, you know, to uh, film folk that want to go see short films. They're not going to be kind of displayed to everyone. Whereas The Master's Pupil now sits in my Steam library alongside other, you know, AAA games and other indie games. The market space is, is the same but you just kind of pay different amounts to see, to experience different games. And that's the way it's, it's regulated itself, right? And so I realized I could do this big thing just by myself um, and that it was still multidisciplinary. It had your writing, it had your directing, it had your, you know, uh, cinematography, it had your kind of, you know, set design and that kind of thing. But then you're adding on extra stuff. So that you're adding on more multidisciplinary you know, areas, so like uh, coding and um, animation, and then, you know, finally a, a play it. It's not just a multidisciplinary artwork, it's a multidisciplinary experience. You get to not only experience all these things, but interact with them on a really one-to-one -one level. So for me, it was like an evolutionary thing. I started with painting and 2D art and got into animation and then into film and this like broader life, you know, kind of, experiential stuff um and then it experienced you know got all to games and for me i don't feel the necessary way to go back because i really love games i really love the way that they are forming and the industry it makes um as well as that again this one this next one currently overseas 
in Croatia at the moment. And I'm getting to make this on this same laptop that I'm, I'm talking to you on. So I, again, I'm just doing this like in my room on the side. Well, not on the side, it's still, it's practically nine till five, but it's like, it's a way that I get to continuously do my art um, without having to kind of stop and wait for a weekend every six months, basically. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a really good way of putting it. I saw a clip from Guillermo del Toro earlier who was saying that, um, you know, with film directors, it's not like uh, when a film director dies, they go into his room and they they find a bunch of old DVDs and go like, oh, wow, look at all these DVDs we never, we never saw, you know? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yep. I think artists get the ability to kind of practice and try and make sketches and that kind of thing. Directors don't have that ability. Uh, there are still a bunch of like prototype games somewhere on my computer, but I don't know how playable they are. <laughs> they were pretty like sketchy. They got them just working right so I could test something. I don't know if the trick works still, but there might still be some kind of DVD in my closet equivalent. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't know though. I, I've seen some people make some stuff just with uh, with the Unreal Engine now and doing like a basic mocap and putting stuff together. I mean, like the opportunities for for creative people to do stuff now it's just I feel like it's endless you know every day yeah. you know you, you can find people that have figured out their lane and whenever they figured out their lane um, you know the this is really the sky is the limit as far as like how well it is that they can do you know I mean yeah I, I like, like I yeah there's sure. I think there's just a broad there's a there's a broad area out there I think you know, part of what the internet's been doing over the last two decades is to just put the tools in people's hands and enable them to just keep making stuff and doing things and being um, switched on to other people and what they're doing. It's fascinating. So what kind of advice have you, what, what kind of advice would you give to somebody who wants to create their own thing like you? Like maybe it's not even a game maybe it's like a comic or something along those lines like what is your what is your takeaway from making this game that you would tell to like i don't know a younger artist hmm. i think if it's broader and not games i think it's just the matter of doing it i think there's a lot of people that can draw or they can write or they like drawing or they like writing but maybe they're not quite good enough um or just they're holding themselves back quite a lot. And um, that's bullshit. They should do it. <laughs> they should just do it straight away. Like, I think waiting on something is a mistake because, you know, you have to be in it to win it, right? You have to actually try and do something. It's, it's not good enough to go, like, I have an idea for a book. That doesn't make you a writer um, or an author. You have to actually go and do it. So I think that's the first step is just do it, you know, do the Nike way and just do it. And <laughs> then, um, you know, work out if it's good or bad, because I think the fear of doing something bad is what stops a lot of people, maybe, you know, fear of failure, I guess. But I think that's inevitable. You're going to make something bad, but you need to make something bad to then make good stuff. You know, like one of my art teachers at uni said, uh, you need to all keep an art diary as you're working. You need to be constantly updating it and constantly sketching in it and doing all stuff in it, like little practices. Like everything you will make, 90% of it will be 90% of everything you will make is shit. 10% is gold. So you have to get you have to get through the 90% to make the 10%. 10% is at the end. And so you need to be doing something to be able to finish it. Um so yeah, that's the first one. Do it. <laughs> and then yeah. I think the second one is maybe closer to and that's you know, that's it. well, it could be applied to everything really. Um because you know, these things take a long time. So 
it, and it ties into the doing is that like if you're if you're consistently doing it and you're working away on it you're at least making a uh, trajectory and you need to be able to uh step yourself away from day-to-day -day, uh wins and chalk that up to just walking up a big button and just because you're not at the peak in day one doesn't mean that you're failing you know you need to be able to kind of compartmentalize uh the project as a whole and what you do day to day because you know for game development and you know writing a novel is is similar or maybe doing a large body of work you know like painting or whatnot but for game design it's it, it takes so long to do that you need to be able to enjoy just the day-to-day -day stuff and the chipping away and the the crafting of it because if you're not enjoying that don't do it <laughs> so that's that's my you know that's my like continuous structure there it's do it have a go actually try do you like the day, day and if so yes keep going and do it every day and if not don't worry about it and don't be an artist or a, a writer because that's what those things are i think a lot of people go like oh i'd love to be a writer i'd love to just sit there and write a book and then when they sit there and write a book it's really boring and they hate it and they're like well no actually i just want to be an author that's different. Right. you know don't try and be the thing just do the thing that you want to do. And if that's not enjoyable, then... <laughs> yeah, it's like if people want the clout, but they don't want to... They, they do don't the work. Want... Yeah. yeah, yeah. I I feel like that's so much of what uh, we've seen with a lot of the AI art stuff that's come out recently, where it's like people feel like they've done something because they clicked a button and now yeah. they want they want to take it and they want to sell it or something and it's like but you didn't do anything like I, yeah and at the same time you know those tools are fantastic like i have no qualms with those tools used mm -hmm. in many ways right i don't think they're going to take over from actual thing like actual art mm -hmm. but they yeah. are going to have a finer place there's the genies out of the bottle they're going to be a thing but mm -hmm. I, you know i think people have to realize that creating something and sharing something and selling something are all different kind of things. And mm -hmm. you just have to know where you're, it's the same thing. Like images are the easier and easier as we go along. You're like when I started first dealing with like Photoshop and making Photoshop art, I couldn't like, this is a kid, you know, I was probably like 10 or something. I couldn't admit um, any art I did on the computer and print it out and submit it into an art fair or like an art, you know, show mm -hmm. or something, art competition. They just wouldn't allow it because it was an, it was made on the computer and that's cheating. You know, that's cheating. So you can't do that. You have to think. It's like every photographer, every artist will Photoshop up their their work somehow. Even if there's like, you know, a if you take a scan of a of a painting or a drawing. Then people will touch it up. I mean, maybe not touch it and, and change, but they'll change colors so it looks more like the real life thing. You know, so there's people are manipulating stuff all the time. It's just a matter of, you know, it just jumped. It just seemed to jump pretty quickly to AI art. And I think that's going to mess with stuff a lot. But if it happened slowly, then we would have just integrated it as we are now, but just more slowly and people would be more accepting. But now you can go, you know, pope in a big white puffer jacket and go boop and it just does it and nobody can work it out. It's just too quick for people, you know. Yeah, it's, it's definitely weird. Yeah, but I, I do agree with what we were saying earlier. Like there's there's still so there's more opportunities for people that are doing creative stuff than there's ever been. And there's never yeah. been so many amazing tools for people. If you were if you were starting in um, like was there was there something that you learned later on in the process of like making a game that you look back on and you were like man if I had done it this way from the beginning I would have saved myself so much trouble like I know there had to be something like you didn't back up your hard drives once or something. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, like definitely. Like there was loads of that kind of stuff. Um, but it is hard because it's it's almost like especially coding is a like that because you create this kind of like structure thing that works the background of the, of the how the game works. And only really towards the end of it, you're like, ah, oh, now I have to go back into this thing that I made like seven years ago and like fiddle and try and work out because some bug is happening. It's constant, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So you're constantly dealing with that kind of stuff, like haunted by your bad decisions. But <laughs> I think, you know, it comes back down to those like failures, you know, like uh, failing, like uh, failing forward, you know, like that idea yeah. of like you fail, but you use it to, to to build and I think yeah. I think that's necessary like there has to be that moment and you, if you're a kid now especially and you're starting to like deal with computers and deal with like a lot of um, you've got your own job and that kind of thing I fear for those kids the first time they're going to lose everything because I don't know if that happened to you do you remember like the first time you like you computed like crashed yeah. And you lost like, everything on your computer. Yeah. Like that now, it happens less and less because we've got like cloud backups and we've got like, you know, you can mm-hmm. get stuff off and hard drives and all sorts of kind of stuff. But, you know, the first time that happened to me, I was like, never again. Never again <laughs> am I going to lose my hard drive. I'm going to like, I'm going to work and make sure that like this never happens again. And that's going forwards, right? It's like you failed in some way because you were not prepared. Or well, maybe you didn't have the foresight, mm-hmm. but you have to now be better and get better because otherwise you're going to lose all your shit again. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Cool, man. Well, um, I, I guess we're closing in on an hour. Uh, so can you can you give us a hint on what you're working on or you don't want to talk about it? Are you under an NDA? <laughs> you and, no, no, no. This is my own project. Um, I will keep a little tight lipped on it but it's it's not a 2d puzzle game side swing you know mm. I, I don't know if i could do that to my hands my wrist again i don't know if i could paint an entire game but yeah. you know for me it's uh, like i was saying earlier you know like i i i went into 2d games because i wanted to um that that felt right like i understood the way that design worked and i could iterate on it and build on it um and so for me, that was, yeah, that was the way forward, right? And the whole process over the last like, seven years, I've learned about game design and how to design more pl- complex games and how systems work. And I really wanted to get into that. Like I was saying, I, I have come up with this game slowly over the course of two, three years, and I've been layering more ideas on top of each other. And yeah, I just want to kind of, delve into that and 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 experience something that's more complex it's more um you know in, in game language it's like linear versus like open so mm-hmm. you know linear 2d side it's not necessarily straight but you're, you're experiencing from start to finish um whereas you know more games uh, games now are becoming more and more like toys there is a, a landscape that you can play with um there is a mechanics that you can play with uh, and if you can do a blend story, you have this world and you have a a story being told in the world that you are experiencing while playing with this kind of toy experiential, like, you know, mechanic kind of things. That's what I'm more excited about at the moment, rather than just another 2D puzzle kind of thing. I, I wouldn't want to do the same thing over, basically. Um, Okay. But it's it's hard. <laughs> it's yeah. But you know, I've got to take my own advice and just one step at a time and keep failing forwards. I think. Cool, man. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to chat with me. Um, for anybody that's listening, yeah. I'm going to put all of Pat's links to the Master's Pupil and uh, and any social media it is that he has in the description box. Uh, my name is Wesley Edwards. You can check out my art, my illustration stuff in the uh, description box as well. And uh, thank you guys for watching the podcast. Take it easy. Yeah.